Hello everyone and welcome to the fourth les to the fourth lesson of the quarter. I'd like to start by introducing the panelists. Uh, we have Teacher Nico, Finley, Silas and Avin. On the orchestra we have Ashleen and Elsie and on the sign language we have Joyce. Last but not least, I'm Deborah and before we start, let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our kind and loving Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for the viewers who are watching who are watching this lesson. We pray that you may be able to bless everyone who may be able to hear the message. We pray all this trusting and believing. Amen. Greetings to all of you and welcome to our lesson of the quarter, the fourth lesson of the quarter. Last week we covered building a house of God. Today our lesson will be the wise and foolish king. With me on the panel on my left are uh, Avin Mosomi. Then we have Benithian Silas. Mm -hmm. Finley Chabari. Thank you. And we'll be discussing the fourth lesson of this quarter, which is titled The Wise and Foolish King. It's a bit contradictory to talk about a king who is both wise and foolish at the same time. But we'll find out how even through this lesson. But before we begin, I'd like us to start with a word of prayer. So, Avin, please pray for us. Shall we pray? 
Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us. Now as we're beginning our lesson study, may you grant us knowledge that you may embark on this study with, with sufficiency that you may understand everything. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Who is the wise and the foolish king? We we'll learn about the story of King Saul from the book of 1 Kings chapter 11. And uh, King Solomon, sorry, pardon me, from the book of 1 Kings chapter 11. And I'd like us to read 1 Kings 11 verse 11. The Bible says, Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and will give it to thy servant. Solomon did some things that were not in line with the statutes of God. And he strayed away from the commandments of God. And God decided to take away the kingdom from him and give it to his servant. Before we delve into this story to understand the context of it, I'd like us to look at the what do you think section of our lesson, which will help jog our minds and help us to think about some of the things that may be taken from us. Avin, can you take us through this? Um, yes. Um, first of all, to begin this basis, if you think about your life in, gen in general, there are some things that you've done which may lead to consequences later. For example, when you're a child, you may misbehave and your parents may give you consequences. So like that, we may begin our what do you think section. Imagine that your parents are going to take one of the following items from you. On a scale of one to ten, one meaning you have to have it, and ten meaning you don't really have to have it. Rank these following items in order of importance to you. So the first one is money, cell phone, internet access, and freedom to hang out. For me, for me personally, mm -hmm. I think I think money money is my number one because like. With money, you can, you can get a cell phone, you can get internet access, mm -hmm. then you can also like hang out with your friends like somewhere mm. with, the, with the money you have. So I feel like money is the most important thing for me. What do you think, Silas? Okay, for me, I think it's internet access because even if I have money, perhaps it's not really enough to sustain all the internet I need or I want to use. So I think internet access is the most crucial. Okay, or what do you think, Finley? For me, my number one is freedom to hang out with friends. With friends, you build social security and your friends can help you with money and also they can assist you to access the internet. Yeah. So that's a sensible argument. Let's, let's now listen to teacher Nico. Yeah, I'd also think I, I concur with Finley quite a bit on that. Uh, if you have friends, they can help you supply all these other things. And they can guide you to sources of money. I was thinking about what would be the last one on my list when I look at these things. And I'm thinking maybe the cell phone is the last thing. If you have a chance to hang out with your friends, then you can get access to these things even when you don't have it. The only difficulty you would be talking or finding these friends who you're going to hang out with. Yeah, but that's, that's basically what I think. Though all the others are important as well. Mm -hmm. um, moving on, uh, to build on this also, let's, let's take our key text. Mm -hmm. uh, First Kings chapter 11, verse 9 and 10, it says, The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord. The the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice, although he forbid, although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So here we are basically shown, but into the story we are shown what happens due to Solomon not following God's instructions. That's basically what I've said. Mm -hmm. If as a child you did something wrong, you have consequences. Solomon also did something, and he got consequences. Yes. Mm. Thank you. Uh, even as we proceed, I'd like us now to talk about this story. We can find out now what was taken away from Solomon. Silas, can you guide us into this story to understand what were the things that 
led to God wanting to take away the kingdom from King Solomon? What is it that he had done? And from this we can draw out the lesson of why he's considered a wise and foolish king. As we know, King Solomon is the wise, was the wisest man living on the earth at his time. So what is it that led him to be also considered foolish? Okay, so King Solomon asked for wisdom from God and mm -hmm. he was given wisdom and from the wisdom he was given, he had wealth and he had all the power in the world because he had the wisdom to rule it. And after gaining all the riches and all the power he had, he, he somehow loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. But Solomon didn't listen to the advice of God after he had been given what he asked for. And this came with consequences. So because of that, he, the kingdom was taken away from him. Yeah. So looking at some of the things that are in the out of the story section, Please guide us through those and maybe we can see uh, if we can relate this account of King Solomon to what we have in our modern life today. Okay, so what parts of this story are new to you, uh, mm. Avin? Uh, the parts that are new to me are that Solomon built specific, I think specific altars for specific gods of each of his wives that had foreign gods, because mm. he didn't he didn't go out of his way just to worship them, not 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 really worship them. He didn't go out of his way to condone them with his wives. He went out of his way to build temples for these gods to be worshipped. So mm. That's that's a part that I didn't know before. Mm. Okay, Finley. So the most striking striking part is that Solomon disobeyed God by inter intermarrying with idol Okay, so the next question is, in spite of David's sin with Bathsheba, this passage says that David followed God completely. What does this tell, what does this tell us about what God values in his children? Yeah, because from this passage, we've also seen that David followed God completely despite his sin with Bathsheba. And for me, I see in this passage that if you sin and ask God for forgiveness and you repent sincerely, you'll be forgiven and you can live a righteous life again. Yeah. Jenny, what do you think? Yeah, uh, in regard to this section, I, I think that it's important to note how David is considered a righteous person. David killed someone, he slept with Bathsheba, but God still says that he had completely followed him. Now this might not sound true at face value, but it's clear to us that Christ wipes out our sins completely when we repent. So just like David repented, he says, he was sorrowful for his sin. And as a result of the sorrow he had for his sin, Christ forgave him and wiped out his sin, such that when we start reading the account in the book of First Kings, we are told that David, I mean King Solomon, yeah, David followed God with a perfect heart and he followed him correctly. So when we look at this question that you're talking about, God values true repentance in his children. So, Avin, what do you think about this question? What does this passage say to you about self-discipline in, in the choice of a life partner? How can that influence our relationship with God? Fine. I feel that absolute discipline to God results in a healthy relationship with God. Because once you start 
trying your own thing, once you start believing in yourself, you stray from God. Mm-hmm. Because, okay, fine, even the story for, for Saul, he was sent to kill uh, one of the tribes, but then he brought back the king and he brought back some, some cattle in the name of we should sacrifice them to God. But now that's not what God wanted. And from there, Saul fell off. His relationship with God fell off because he didn't fully follow God's instructions. So I feel like utmost obedience to God leads to a healthy life, a relationship with God. Yes. Okay. For me, I think for the part of a life partner, it's, you'll spend most of your time with them, so they have the highest influence on you. Yeah. So if we make a wrong choice in regard to the life partner that we have, we might be taken away from God, just like King Solomon, right? Yeah, there are consequences that we can see evidently from the story. And for King Solomon, it was being taken away from the God of heaven that he worshipped. And when we actually speak of something that was new to me in this story, I noticed that all the 700 wives were actually princesses. So all of them were royalty. They're not just normal people. Then now the other wives or concubines that he had, the 300 were just now the normal ladies. But the people he took as wives were princesses. So they are the best that was in their kingdoms. So I, I, I found that very interesting. I'd like us to read the book of Ezra, chapter 9, verse 6. Ezra, chapter 9, verse 6. So the Bible says in Ezra, chapter 9, verse 6, that, And said, O my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee. My God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass is grown up into the heavens. We find that uh, this is a prayer of shame. And we, this is in Ezra. When Ezra is re- narrating this account, he's ashamed to lift up his face to God because of the iniquities that they have had. And I can imagine, just like King Solomon had done iniquity, this is the same thing, but for Ezra... He was afraid to pray. He, was, he didn't even want to offer a prayer because of the way they had sinned. And the flashlight and even the prophets and king's passages we are reading in chapter 3 and 4 give us more insight on this. I'd like you, Finley, to tell us the experience, how Ellen White narrates what happened to King Solomon. So in the flashlight part, it says that had Solomon continued in humility of mind to turn the attention of men from himself to the one who had given him wisdom and riches and honor, what a history might have been his. But while the pen of inspiration records his virtues, it also bears faithful witness to his downfall, raised to a pinnacle of greatness and surrounded with the gifts of fortune. Solomon became dizzy, lost his balance, and fell. Prophets and Kings, page 68. So we should explain what Ellen White meant by this statement. And the first one is Solomon became dizzy. For me, he became dizzy when God blessed him with riches and he started putting his priorities before God's priorities. What about you, Silas? Okay, I think that's Solomon had all this wealth and all the wisdom. He was, he's the wisest man on earth who ever lived. And so from this, instead of giving God the glory to what he had, he, he had pride in his achievements, which were enabled by God. And that's why he turned away. Having any thoughts? What happens when you're dizzy, if I may ask? You are not really in a state where you can make right decisions. Mm. You can't even probably stand properly and stuff. Mm -hmm. So for me, I feel like in this context, 
uh, for you to become dizzy, first you have to be upright. You have to be okay. This basically symbolized how Solomon, when he started his reign, he asked God for wisdom. He didn't ask God for fame, money. He didn't. He asked God for wisdom, which is right, which is righteous in my in my view, because he wanted to rule the God's kingdom. He wanted to rule God's kingdom on earth, which is Israel, with a lot of wisdom, so that he doesn't fall astray like the past two kings. Mm -hmm. But now later, we now see he's becoming dizzy, which means he's now falling astray. He's now marrying foreign wives, which leads him to adopting all these other gods. Mm -hmm. Then he finally falls off, which means he, I feel like he's totally lost in a point where he has to turn back unless his kingdom will just fall straight off. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's the progression of how he started well and ended falling off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Finley? Career. So for me, he lost balance when he started intermar intermarrying with the foreign wives. And he fell when he built temples of their gods beside his own god. He built temples of other gods beside his own god. Yes. Solomon became dizzy. No clarity of thought. Lost, losing his balance, as well explained by Alvin. He started making decisions that did not look right, marrying other foreign wives. Then finally his fall is he was led away from God entirely. That's an experience all of us can experience in our lives. The moment we don't have clarity of thought, we then start making decisions that are not right. Then after that we find that we are far away from God. So it's important for us to think as teenagers even in our lives, what are some of the things that make us get dizzy, per se? Uh, Finley or Silas or Ravin, anyone has any things that you think may make you dizzy? What are some of the things that may lead you away from God? Or something that has led you away from God? I, I can go first. Uh -huh. I feel like peer pressure mm. is one of the main factors. Because with peer pressure, you're led astray by your, your own friends who you trust. Yes. They, for example, Sabbath, uh, they can say, let's go for a party or something on Sabbath. Let's, let's hang out on Sabbath mm -hmm. while you should be in church. So I feel like they lead you astray. They make you dizzy. Now you can't really think. Now mm -hmm. on, on Friday nights when we have Vespers, instead of thinking about the Sabbath and how you're going to keep it in truth and the spirit, you're busy preparing what clothes you're gonna wear, mm -hmm. what, what, how much money you're gonna carry there. Mm -hmm. You're preparing yourself for the wrong thing, mm -hmm. while you're supposed to be turning your eyes on Jesus. Yeah, that's what I feel like. Amen. Mm -hmm. okay, for me, I think it's either your friends or perhaps your your phone. Yeah, and basically your phone is just talking to your friends or you're watching something, yeah, mm -hmm. which comes with internet access. Oh, it comes with internet access, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Finley? I will say in school. Yeah. When others are studying on Saturday, you go to church the whole day, the teacher tells you, come to class, study, mm -hmm. you've paid for that money because it is a remedial. Mm -hmm. And... As a Christian, you sometimes feel dizzy, but we should not lose balance and fall. Yeah. Yes, we should not lose balance and fall as Christians. So those are some important lessons that are given to us. And in the spirit of Ezra 9 verse 6, the Bible speaks severally about having sorrow for sin, being ashamed for what you've done and even leading you to true repentance so that you stop committing sin or iniquity knowingly, but turning away from it. And there are some punchlines which I believe are promises as well, which we can keep in our hearts. And uh, I'd like to ask uh, Silas to guide us through this. Okay, so for the punchlines, mm -hmm. I'll just speak the one that speak, speaks to me the most, and then each one of you can 
also pick yours. Sure. So mine is Second Thessalonians 3 verse 3. It says, But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. This text stood out because it's, it's a promise that no matter what happened, God is still there and he'll always be there with you. Yeah. Amen, amen. Finley. So my verse is Psalms 25 verse 8, which says, Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in his ways. So we can always be assured when we plan to do the right thing mm -hmm. and we fail, just like the saying which goes, the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. Mm -hmm. We can always depend on God to return us to his ways as long as we heed to his voice. Mm. Amen. Evan? Uh, the verse that stood out for me is Ezra 9 verse 6. Mm -hmm. I am too ashamed and disgraced, my God, to lift up my face to you because our sins are high than our heads and our guilt has reached to the heavens. For me, for this verse, I feel like in our day-to-day -day lives when we sin, we feel weary of God's presence, that we can't approach God after we've done sin. Mm. But now, I feel like even at our lowest moments, we should always seek God. Mm -hmm. And even after we've sinned, that's when we should turn to God, ask for forgiveness, we should repent our sins, and uh, strive to be like Jesus, in my opinion. Amen. Amen. I can relate to the verse that Finley said, which is Psalm to chapter 25, verse 8, where the Bible states that good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. Okay, so I'd like us to, mm -hmm. to think about this. Does the sorrow of sin catch your attention in Ezra, verse, chapter 9, verse 6? There's sorrow in that verse, and there's a promise in in Second Thessalonians chapter three, verse three, mm -hmm. and it kind of counters the verse mm -hmm. because the sorrow is talking about us being in sin and being afraid to ask God for help because we think our sin is too big. Yeah, and Second Thessalonians. Chapter 3, verse 3 says that the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. Mm. Yeah. Amen. So we shouldn't ever think that our sins are too hard for us to overcome. We should trust God. Yes, yeah, so those are encouraging punchlines that we can keep in our lives even as we seek to remain steadfast. Even when we feel we have done shameful things, God is saying he is faithful and he will not let us be overcome by the evil one. Now, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 4, says a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. I repeat, a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. Most people who read the story of the life of Solomon focus on the number of wives that he had. This is 700 wives and 300 concubines. But is this really the only thing we should focus on? Uh, Finley, can you tell us more about this from your reading of the flashlight section in Proverbs 12 verse 4? What is the main focus that we should be looking at here, other than just the wives and the concubines? We should... According to me, we should look for a wife who, mm -hmm. who brings together the family. Mm -hmm. Just like Proverbs 12 verse 4 says that mm -hmm. a good wife is the crown of a husband. Mm -hmm. uh, a home is made up of a father, a mother, and the children. Mm -hmm. And so should, uh, the children stays most with the mother. Mm -hmm. So when you get a good wife, you can be assured that your children will be nice mm. yeah. and God-fearing. Okay, okay. Yes. Avino Silas, do you agree with this? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, I noticed we're all gentlemen on the panel. 
I think he's speaking <laughs> to us on something that is key for us. So when, okay, when you are choosing, I think I'm married here, but when you decide to choose a wife, you need to choose a wife uh, from the Lord. And this also shows something else that is really key. The choice of a life partner determines how you worship God. This is something that is important because if you choose a wrong wife, then you'll end up not worshiping the Lord correctly. And if you look in First Kings, there's a list of women that are mentioned that King Solomon married. And they're all from the foreign tribes. The Bible says, but King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh. You remember we said that these 700 wives were princesses, yeah. So together with the daughter of Pharaoh, the first princess, then he also had the women of Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Zidonians, and the Hittites. And these are the nations which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, you shall not go in unto them, neither shall they come in unto you. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto this in love. That's from the book of First Kings, chapter 11, verse 1 and verse 2. So, uh, Silas, could you share with us one of the amazing uh, things that we learned from the lesson in the Did You Know section? Okay, so the Did You Know section talks about Solomon, and mm -hmm. it says, Did you know that Solomon built temples for the worship of the heathen gods? In addition to the temple he built for the true God. Mm -hmm. What's more, he didn't just build them in some obscure places, safe out of sight. He built them on a hillside opposite Mount Moriah, the exact spot where he had built a magnificent temple for God. Mm -hmm. yes, so this shows that from Solomon being the king who built the temple of the Lord instead of his father David, that same spot where he built the temple for God, mm -hmm. he also built a temple for his heathen gods. And this shows that he turned away from God completely. Um, yes. For me, I feel like, I feel that the spouses have really a big role in the choice of the other spouse. Mm -hmm. For example, here, Solomon loved his wife, that's why he wanted to make magnificent things for them, mm -hmm. not something that to hide, but now for them to be shown all over. Mm -hmm. Another example is when Jezebel wanted the vineyard, mm -hmm. Ahab was quick. He didn't really think about it because mm -hmm. this is his love. This is his lovely wife. Yes. So he was, he he had the request and was like, it's it's finished. Mm -hmm. So spouses have a huge role in the partner's choices, I feel like. Amen. And there are several stories that speak to this. Does any of you remember any other story where uh, the wife of someone led them astray? I feel like I know another one. Yes, which one? Um, Samson. Yes. Very Samson common. was given mm -hmm. straight instructions that mm -hmm. you should not marry from these certain tribes. Mm -hmm. And he went and married. He went and chilled with another lady from mm. the tribe of Saul, not to Delilah. Mm. And eventually, he was brought down. Mm. He, he loved her so much th to the point that he gave out his secret of where his strength came from. Mm. And Delilah, since she had hidden intentions, she went and told mm. immediately his weakness, and that's what brought destruction to him. Yeah. Say this in the Bible, yes, Finley. I cannot, I cannot also forget our first parents, uh -huh. Adam and Eve. Uh -huh. Eve tempted, uh, Eve tempted Adam to eat the apple. Yes. So she led him, she led him astray. Yeah, that's interesting. That the good wife Adam had was from the Lord. <laughs> so it just shows us how vulnerable we are to sin. Even if God creates and gives you a wife. Like in the case of Adam and Eve, uh, his wife still led him to sin. Would we say that she was from a heathen nation? Probably not. 
but it shows us that the kind of spouse you marry affects your life. And as you rightly stated, Eve's decision affected Adam, which even means a Christian's wife can affect them in a negative way. So uh, I'd like us to give our closing thoughts before we wrap it up. So we can start with you, Finley. What are some of the key lessons and takeaways you have from this lesson about the wise and foolish king? And we'll have Silas next, then Alvin will go last. We should let God have full control of our life, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to the marriage life. Yeah. Mm. Very important. Uh -huh. For me, I'll just read the further insight. Mm -hmm. It says, he who falls into some of the grosser sins may feel a sense of shame and poverty and his need of grace, of the grace of Christ, but pride feels no need, and so it, is closes, it closes the heart against Christ and the infinite blessing he came to give. So this flashlight basically says that, sorry, not the flash, the Father Insight says that when you do a sin that feels big to you. Mm. You get into basically a, a, a notion that you can't ask God for forgiveness because your sin is too big. And mm. you should learn that there's nothing too big that God can do. Mm. Amen. Uh, my moral lesson is that we should involve God in in all aspects of our lives, in all the decisions that we make, that we may not be led astray by even our own very spouses, mm -hmm. so that we may follow in his footsteps and make the right decisions. Yeah. Amen. Yes, uh, there are lots of lessons to learn from the wise and foolish king. Even as we wrap it up, I'd like to give a short illustration. Eskimos kill wolves in a very brutal way. They take a knife and they put animal blood on it until it is fully covered in blood. And given that Eskimos live in the snowy areas of the world, they bury the knife with the blade facing up and it's fully covered in blood. And when a wolf comes and smells using its strong sense of smell, it actually reaches the knife and then because it loves the blood, it starts licking and licking and licking this blood, not knowing that there is a blade of a knife hidden underneath. And the wolf continues licking this blood to the point the blade starts cutting its tongue, but it licks the blood because it loves it and it thinks it's still licking the blood that was on the knife. But it eventually dies as a result of cutting itself on the tongue to death, bleeding. And this is the same thing that sin does to us. King Solomon went and married foreign wives thinking that it was not such a big thing, but he eventually ended up setting up places for worship for these foreign wives. As a result of this, the whole nation of Israel saw these places that were set up to worship other gods as a result of doing the things that God had commanded them not to do. So God's call to us in this lesson can be found in the book of 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 13, which I'll read. The Bible says, Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes, according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. God expects us to follow him in his ways. And if we do the wrong thing, we can repent and be like David who is considered to have had a perfect heart and not remain in sin like King Solomon, who was wise but made the wrong decisions to the point the kingdom was taken away from him. So it's a call to all of us to be wise and we ask God for wisdom and in case we fall into sin, let's ask him for forgiveness and not stick to our sinful ways. I'd like to invite Silas to give us the closing prayer. 
Let's pray. Our Father, those above in heaven, thank you this day. We thank you for your love and your care. We pray that you may help us make wise choices and give all the glory that belongs to you back to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.